Hey everybody, this is Captain Kyle. I'm here with Mick Winger. Very talented man. You might know him from Arcane, from playing Tony Stark in What If, from Kung Fu Panda, the series. Um, various DC and Marvel animated series, and and you have a sci-fi horror drama podcast yep. called Hidden Frequency. That's correct. Which we are going to talk about too. Excellent. But first, I want to talk about your wonderful voice acting career. Now, you've auditioned probably for a few roles, I'd say. A couple. Uh, one or two. And how has the audition process changed since nowadays there's a lot more NDAs and a lot more... Well, you kind of hit the nail right on the head. Like, the biggest change in the audition process right now is how secretive uh everything is and how often we'll get sides that either we have to sign an nda for or they're they'll come out in uh coded as something else they'll they'll be sides that um you know they'll take a character and give them a generic name and sometimes it's very easy to see through them um you know when they were casting various different Marvel properties, you know, that have already come out that when the sides went around, they were super secret. And so it was, they used code words and code names for the characters. And I'm like, mm, that's Kingpin. Mm -hmm. Come on. Uh, it, it's Roger Stevens. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this character's named Fred and he's an underworld Kingpin of New York City. Oh, OK, Fred. <sighs> But anyway, yes, that's the biggest thing. Um, what What's interesting, though, you know, not just from a mechanical perspective, but in terms of the industry itself, so many more sides are coming coming through for adult drama animation. Things like Arcane and the Dota series and uh, Castlevania on Netflix, um, you know, adult action genre was pretty much a genre that that kept itself to DC direct DC online direct you know the the 90 minute justice league features or teen titan features or that kind of thing and now the doors wide open we're seeing a ton of adult drama because the 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 studios are picking up on what a wide adult audience they have for animated properties and so we're seeing not only that has the has audi have auditions changed mechanically because of NDAs and we can't talk about it and blah blah blah, but you know on the backside you're still getting your your kids comedies and your preschool shows and the other things that we've done for years. You're getting a lot more of those ju that those juicy meaty dramatic turn audition sites and those are really fun. Those are really fun. And even some that are not appropriate for children at all. Like, I don't know if you've seen Invincible, but that's pretty gory. Yeah, uh, Yes, it is. I uh, am a big fan of the comics. I have not caught the animated series personally yet, but I do have friends on it. And um, and I know that if they stuck to the ethos of the comics, it is a blood fest. So, for sure. Blood fest, yes. <laughs> now... What is your process when you're coming up with a, a new voice for a character? Are you looking at just visuals? Are you looking at backstory? Are you trying to, you know, are, are you really delving in deep? What, what do you take into account when you're coming up with a, a voice for a character that you're going to play? Gosh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, for every actor, it's different. But for me, I rely a lot on what's written in the script. Every character that we are presented for an audition has a, obviously a script of words that they're going to say. And sometimes it's very minimalist, but even in the minimalist scripts and, and you'll, you get, you get used to different networks handing you different kinds. Like I can always tell a Disney set of sides and I can always tell a DreamWorks TV animation set of sides. And I can always tell a cartoon network because of the way that it's formatted and all that stuff. But when I come to it, I let the I try to let the character the scripted lines let the character speak for himself because the writer has given this character life already and 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 this character already has a worldview how he sees everyone how he relates back and forth to the world around him and so I try to discover what's there and then from there is where we can then at least for me as an actor where I can launch off where uh, so I, I figure out which box, which character box this guy fits in, because the dirty little secret about television animation is there's nothing new under the sun. Don't tell anyone I told you this, but all the gags, all the plot points, all the jokes, 
even the stuff that feels fresh? You've seen it all before. They just put it in a different order. That's right. <laughs> and they give it they give it a nice fresh coat of lipstick and rouge to make it look nicer. Uh, fresher anyway. Anyway, um, you figure out what box they're in or I figure out what box they're in. And then from there, you can make some compelling choices. Like there's the archetypical way of playing nerd geek misfit sidekick. And then there's the, yeah, but what if he thinks he's really sexy? Or what if he thinks, you know, what if he's a real snob about it? Or where, you know, that's where you can get into some of the flavors and and choices that become evocative and iconic. Um, I know for for me, a lot of my, my um, work has been voice matching. Originally for Jack Black, but also for Robert Downey Jr. now quite a bit, um, at least in animation. Um, but I've been told on several occasions that that what keeps me in in the gig or what gets me the gig, because there's a ton of voice match actors out there, is the acting choices. And that comes from understanding the character. Like you have to understand that it's not just what does Jack Black sound like to be Poe the Panda? It's how would Poe react to this situation? How does he see the world that would reflect his his reaction? Right. How would his, um, you know, how would his response be influenced by how he feels about the person he's talking to or the situation he's in? And that's that's where it gets really fun is 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 taking that stuff that was already scripted for another property um, and, and taking the elements of that and applying it to brand new material where the, the character gets to live and breathe in his own reality. Take what if, for example. Right there were several moments that we just recreated from the films because Tony, we, we wanted the lead in of Tony Stark from the MCU. And then there were several moments that were branching off. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to give away any spoilers. I mean, what if is still, still fairly fresh. So it's not like citizen Kane, uh, <laughs> like everybody knows the spoiler of citizen Kane, but, uh, I won't give away any spoilers, but what I'll say is this is going with the what if, the series what if it was a great opportunity to take this iconic performance that that Robert Downey Jr had done and as as the writers are exploring well what if it happened differently to be the the person that plays that out and and to go okay we've seen him react this way to these situations throughout 10 years of films now let's take what we know about him and put him in something we haven't seen yet and let that unfold. And as the actor, that's that's a dream. That's a dream. It's so fun. Absolutely. And you're, you're just bringing home the point that there is a misconception with some people that being a voice actor is just being able to do voices. But no, right. it is acting and knowing the character and you know delivering the lines with the emotion behind it. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's even more difficult than live action because you have to convey those emotions with your voice a lot more than, you know, with gestures or expressions. You so. said it. Absolutely. Like, it, it's not that we can't use our face or that we can't use our body language to communicate that. If it helps, if it helps the sound come through clearer, awesome. But we can't lean on those things. Nobody's going to cut to a, a shot of our face, you know, giving a dirty look to somebody that we're angry with in the scene. We have to let that anger be heard. Um, when I teach and I coach, it's uh, one of the things that I say is that for the audience to hear it, uh, for the audience, if the audience can't hear it, it does not exist. Took me a couple of tries on that one. <laughs> but that's what I say. Like, if, if the audience can't hear the disdain in your voice or, or the fact that you're standing at the bottom of a canyon and the other person's at the top, if they can't hear that in your performance, that, that canyon doesn't exist. That disdain you have for the character doesn't exist. And so when you, you ask, like, what's my process for a voice, I'm giving you what my process is for the character. And sometimes that will bring with it certain, you know, touchstones of, oh, my gosh, I grew up with a guy who was this, this exact archetype. And he talked like this the whole time, all the time like this. And so I would just, you know, this would be my audition because I do Jerry from, from middle school or whatever. Um, and, and sometimes there's a vocality that comes with that, but it always has to start with who is this person? And then you can go into, well, okay, well, what then does this person sound like? Um, and as I'm playing this type, this type of character, what does it, what, what does that inspire in me in terms of 
placements and strangeness and that kind of thing. I think I, I listened to when I did Heimerdinger for Arcane, I listened to some reference of the guy from the film or excuse me, uh, from the video game. And I wanted to keep some consistency there, but I also knew from the way that the scene was written that they were want, they were looking for, they weren't looking for video game style acting. They were looking for, or I should say massive multiplayer online video game style acting. They were looking for cutscene style, crisp, dramatic, in the moment stuff. And I honestly, um, I think how I got the gig is because when I approached the scene, I was, I, I looked at him and I said, this is Dumbledore, except he's about science, not magic. So I went in with this very, like, uh, I took my cue from, from the video game, but I decided that, you know, he was, he was always about encouraging his students and he, he kind of knew things that other people didn't know. Um, and the audition scene was the opening scene that we see Heimerdinger with, um, with Jace, as Jace has been put into into lockup because of uh, because of the explosion in his lab, and I just was like, "How would Dumbledore handle this?" And I went into it, and I was like, "Yeah, I think I think that's a good match. I think that's a good fit in in terms of the psychology of the character." And then I got a call back, and we worked on it from there, and I got more specific per their notes, and then from there we got we got the the final Heimerdinger that everybody has heard now. So that is awesome. And it, it, incorporating like characters into your real life. Here, here's a little more fun of a question. You've, sure. you've been Poe in Kung Fu um, Panda. Mm -hmm. How much martial arts do you do in real life? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, well, um, I've watched Kung Fu movies. How's that? And you've heard the song Kung Fu Fighting. And I've heard the song Kung Fu Fighting. Uh, but yeah, I'm not a martial artist in my in my real life, but I've learned to do some some martial arts efforts for sure. All that stuff. Which is also kind of like with the video games that uh, you got to make all those. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're getting hurt a lot. But yeah. It, it's the golden rule of voiceover. If the audience can't hear it, it doesn't exist. So if you don't make those noises, you don't get wounded. Those wounds don't exist in the game because you gotta, you have to vocalize them. Now, I'd like to talk more about your um, your podcast, sci-fi drama, yeah. radio play style, hidden frequencies. What inspired you to do that? A couple of things. I have been a, a fan of radio theater uh, for almost as long as I can remember. I can definitely, in my late my late tweens, early teens, just started listening to all of these old school radio programs that that were being rebroadcast on, you know, AM stations at nine at night. You know, just just programming filler, and they were presented as you know retro retro shows for late listeners. I think one of the programs was called When Radio Was. I mean, that's how nostalgia they were going for. But I listened to it and I loved it. I've always loved audio as a storytelling medium. And then I was narrating, uh, and I still do some narration for uh, an ongoing podcast called the No Sleep Podcast, uh, which is a horror fiction. Um, but they're more narrative with with uh, sound effect elements and dialogue elements. And I thought, man, I want to do a radio show and, and I want to do an anthology. I don't, cause there were other scripted things. There's Tannis, the black tapes, um, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Welcome to uh, Night Vale. These are all like kind of horror sci-fi ish, but they're serialized and, and they were telling a greater story. And one of the things that I loved, loved when I was a kid was the TV anthology. I loved being able to tune in every week and see a different story on, you know, Twilight Zone reruns or Night Gallery or in my day, it was mostly uh, Tales from the Dark Side. So and then in the 90s, we got Tales from the Crypt, that kind of thing. Um, so that's that's kind of what inspired it. And having some experience, you know, getting in there and getting my hands dirty with the No Sleep crew. Uh, I thought, I think I could pull this together and I want to do it with a bunch of my voice actor friends um, because I have access to them and they'll, they'll probably say yes, because this is a great time. So I asked around and everybody pretty much said yes. And that was pretty awesome. Um, and I have some contacts and friends who were writers and I thought, would you like to, or I asked them, would you like to write a Twilight Zone episode for me? <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's not the Twilight Zone, but it's it's that style and it's going to be audio format. And I had several people step up and got our first season of shows, which is available on um, iTunes and Google and Spotify and everywhere that you find your podcasts. Um, and then we were doing live shows and then the pandemic hit. And um, we were doing original new episodes on in live shows. And so we had to put that on hiatus until cons came back. and. Now that they have, we, we not only have a new script library where we are producing in-studio episodes, but we, we're we doing some new live ones, including the one that we're debuting tomorrow here at Zenkai. Yeah, I was going to ask about the uh, the one that you're debuting tomorrow, so thanks for taking away one of my questions. You're but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you um, So the inspiration is definitely the, like the Rod Serling, so it's not just sci-fi, it's usually with some kind of twist that you know, leans it over into horror, like yes, for sure. Breaking your glasses and when you fact, have all the books. We're doing, we're doing uh, as we are recreating a new season this season. We are doing a bit of a, a bit of a shift. We've got a new, a new version, a new arrangement of our theme song for the podcast. We've got a new opening with a new narration. It's going to feel a lot creepier than than the old Twilight Zone, but. My ideal here is still to give you that kind of gut punch twist at the end. That's what made the Twilight Zone so delightful were those episodes where you go, oh, my gosh, no, <laughs> you know, because you think you're going one way and then they pull the mask off and, you know, she's beautiful or, yeah. you know, whatever. Take um, advantages. Sorry, you're still ugly. <laughs> right. Exactly. So love the commentary in those love the love the the um social drama love the twist endings we we're definitely in that zone and now we're we're getting some of that ec this this season we're getting more of that ec comics flair thrown in where it is kind of closer to a tales of the crypt or tales from the crypt or tales of the dark side where it's just a short horror and leaves you yeah, a little creepy at the end so um Hopefully, we're going to find a really good amal amalgam with the scripts we have this season. Um, but it is a bit of a twist. It's a bit of a pivot. Have you gotten M. Night Shyamalan to write it for you yet? Not yet. Not yet, but he's on the list for sure. As is, uh, as is Jordan Peele. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so you've attended a number of conventions. Is there a particular experience with a fan that springs to mind that's really memorable? Hmm. Gosh, I, yeah, I, I have to say that um, there's a great number of um, there's a great number of fans out here in my experience at the, at the conventions that uh, represent the neurodiversity uh, that we see in today's society. There's a lot of neurodivergent fans and um, my wife and I have a couple of neurodivergent sons. And so watching one particular interaction in partic um, that I'm recalling is from this last last summer I was up in in Canada and uh, got a chance to to meet uh, a young man I believe who's on the autism spectrum and just watching his parent his mother guide him through and he was a young adult at this point certainly I want to say he looked as though he was in his early 20s um, but he came up talked to me wanted to talk to me all about Kung Fu Panda and all about Iron Man and had clearly, you know, made my work in the industry his homework. Like he, he studied like what I would, uh, what I had done. And he just wanted to tell me how, you know, how much he loved my stuff and, and it's interactions like that. And, and watching his, his parent help, help him navigate through the rest of the convention and 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 w while also trying to keep keep a, a, a you know a certain amount of distance and letting him just be himself and and interact on his own that you know it almost made me cry it was so beautiful because i could identify with that my wife and i have had those kinds of moments where our sons have met up with people that they admire either through their YouTube channel or Twitch stream or whatever. And, um, and I know what that feeling is. And there's just something about being able to, to connect with and to 
uh, and to be an encouragement and or inspiration for for my neurodivergent fans that really speaks to me. Well, that is awesome. And and it's great to know that your work has had an influence on someone yeah. so much that, you know, it's it's shattered some barriers within him. Absolutely. So you talk about people meeting their idols. Mm. Which of your idols have you met? Oh gosh. Um which of my idols have I met? Uh, I've only met a few people that uh, that I, I would absolutely say are star that I got starry eyed about. One of them was Rob Paulson, who uh, many of your viewers probably know from his work on Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, uh, most anything in the eighties and nineties. I mean, he he's one of those generation spanning voice actors, and when I met him, uh. I was a little, I was a little uh, agape. I didn't know. I was like, ah, you're Rob Paulson and I like your work. And then, and then like three years later, after I'd met him, cause it, I, I first really met him socially when he was in on an episode for Legends of Awesomeness, Kung Fu Panda Legends of Awesomeness. And um, we only really got a chance to chat in passing, but we did. And we kind of just stayed in touch, stayed connected. I was um, went on to like teach and host some classes at local in Los Angeles, and he came and guest taught for me. And um, and you know, I I try not to bug Rob Paulson, uh, <laughs> but then like three years later, he had me as a guest on his podcast, uh, Talking Tunes, when it was still on uh, Nerdist, and that was super cool to be able to sit there and chat with Rob as as a peer and go oh my gosh this is rob balton um but yeah i mean he, he obviously i'm still getting starry-eyed about rob Paulson. <laughs> the other the couple of others um are uh steven root and i got to meet him again through uh voiceover uh on legends of awesomeness but steven root is a great guy and super funny uh and Diedrich bader I'll never forget, like, I got a little, like, starry-eyed Diedrich Bader because not only, um, not only is he himself and his, with his on-camera career, but he also, at the time, was just coming off of Batman Brave and the Bold. So he was one of the voices of Batman. Uh, and so to be able to, to, you know, work with him, connect with him, and unlike Rob, Rob had a special session because he has, was so busy, and they brought him back. And, or rather than they brought me in. With Diedrich, we were in the booth together at the same time and you know, with the whole cast and we were all cutting up and it was just super cool. It was super cool. I got a little starry eyed for Diedrich. Um, and then, then Nickelodeon had a Halloween party that year and uh, invited us because we were on one of their active shows and Diedrich was there. And he was so nice to my kids. It was unreal. I was like, that's, that's what a TV star should be like. like Go out of your way to be nice to somebody, um, and that you know, those are the two that I've 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 would really say I got starry eyed over. Um, those are the three, with including Stephen Root. Well, awesome! It's nice to see that people that get starry eyed over you can know that you get starry eyed over oh, for others. Sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like if I met, I don't know. If I met somebody say like, and I know he's kind of, the, the name is uh, a little uh, forbidden right now in fan circles, but I have to admit, if I met Chris Pratt, I'd get a little starry eyed. Uh, if I met, uh, if I, if I, here's the thing, Jack Black's world and my world have gone like this and just kind of like the worlds have merged, but I've never met him. But if I met him, I would think I'd be a little gobsmacked. Um, Certainly Robert Downey Jr. I would be like, ah, uh, uh, you are a movie star. <laughs> uh, you Iron Man. Remember that time you played Iron Man? That was so cool. <laughs> and it, I mean, I would be reduced to that. I'm not kidding. Um, oh, I take it back. There's one more. I was in the booth with Mark Hamill on Avengers Assemble. 
and I was pretty gobsmacked. Everybody was asking for selfies and I couldn't bring myself to do it. Not only because I didn't want to be another in the, in the line of, of people in the booth who wanted to get sel selfies with him. And he was so gracious. He did every single one of them. But I also was like, I don't know what to say. He's amazing and I love him. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I almost forgot about that. Uh, he was playing Arnim Zola for Avengers Assemble and I was in as Iron Man. Um, and you'd you'd think you'd think the show was his show because of how everybody was just kind of like you're Mark Hamill. <laughs> There's a few, yeah. I'd, I'd be. I think I'd also be a bit starstruck with Mark Hamill. So, moving on to things that hopefully you can talk about. Are right. there any upcoming projects that you have that you can mention? Ah, there is something I can mention. Speaking of Batman, there's a new preschool show that um, Warner Brothers has announced, and they announced it last fall, called Bat Wheels, and it is looking super awesome. Think uh, living vehicles, with, complete with personalities, you know, kind of like some of the other cars-related vehicles we've seen in the past from those IPs, uh, but they're all the Bat vehicles. Plus, they still interact with uh, Batman, Robin, and the whole Bat family in Gotham City. Uh, it's the first kind. Of, it's the first Batman-themed show for little kids, I think, ever. Um, at least since Super Friends, and. Um, I'm very blessed to be in that cast. We, I believe we debut this fall. So I can talk about that. I can talk about the fact that I play Mo, the uh, mobile operations engineer, I think. Uh, and he is, uh, he is your comic relief um, mechanic that lives in the little robot that lives in the bat cave and maintains, he's the maintenance guy for all the, all the bat wheels. He's got a couple do you, of Do you actually think you could do humor? No, no, no. I'm strictly dramatic. You know, it's like Olivier once said, death is easy. Comedy is hard. Um, but that sounds awesome. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a really good time. It's going to be a really good time. And thankfully, I can also say I'm in a couple of other things that are yet to come. I will also say that it, because it's been announced, um, what if we'll have a season two and Arcane will have a season two and you never know when my characters might show up in those. Well, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you again in both of those. Now, I've been given the high sign. We got to wrap it up. Anything you want to say to your fans before we conclude? Uh, just thank you. Thank you for making this possible. I'm living the dream, as it were, as an actor. And I get to do this because um, because of the support of fans and, and friends like yourselves. Um, and, and I would just say, you know, it's... It's a joy to be able to perform in cartoons and, and podcasts and everything else. And we live in an incredible age. I think my encouragement to you would be go out there and create something. Go out there and do it. Media has been more is more democratized now than it has ever been. And anybody can make a YouTube show. Anybody can make a podcast. Get out there and do it. You know, follow your creative spirit. Great words. And uh, I want to thank you so much, Mick. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Ken. Kyle. <laughs> and, uh, cut that. Just cut that. Just cut that. <laughs> That's okay. I've been called all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Everyone out there, thanks for watching. And as always, have fun and follow your fandom. Thank you for watching this video. I am Invader Zim, and I traffic in doom. And so, if you do not subscribe to this channel, you will have doom that befalls you by me, Invader Zim.